Jesus because Jesus came preaching the gospel. And most people believe the gospel is the message about Jesus, but they forget that Jesus preached a message that was the gospel. To understand the gospel, I think you really have to go back and remember what the prophets wrote. Uh, the great prophet Isaiah talking about the lion and the lamb lying down together. Peace on the earth. The gospel is a message of peace. And in these days where, uh, at the time of, that we are talking, uh, there are presidential elections going on, debates that are taking place, and we're being promised peace and prosperity. In every election that takes place, we have this repetition where men are promising us, vote for me, put me in office, and I will bring you peace and prosperity. I think that true peace and prosperity is only going to be established when Jesus returns to the earth. And to separate Jesus from his gospel message, to separate Jesus from a return to the earth, is to lose that gospel that Jesus preached. So for me, the gospel is that message of peace, the establishment of a government on the earth where true peace and prosperity will be maintained. Now that's good news. For more information on this and other issues of theological interest, visit us online at www.restorationfellowship.org. Also, for further reading on this subject, look for the following books. The Coming Kingdom of the Messiah, A Solution to the Riddle of the New Testament by Sir Anthony Buzzard. They Never Told Me This in Church by Pastor Greg Dibel. Jesus' command to love your neighbor, Matthew 22 verse 39, is arguably the most compelling biblical argument used by Christians to support warfare. How can we stand by and do nothing when we see our brothers and sisters around the world being systematically persecuted, tortured, and killed? Doesn't love of neighbor require us to fight, and even kill, on their behalf so they can be delivered from oppression and tyranny? A lot of Christians think so. In fact, Jesus himself said there was no greater love than laying down our life for our friends, John 15 verse 13. Doesn't this imply that going to war to save others is not only an act of love but one of the most noble things we can do? Many Christians believe we should be willing to engage in war for the sake of those in need even if it costs us our life. At one level, this sounds quite reasonable. We should be eager to help others and willing to make sacrifices to do so. But here's the rub. While there is nothing wrong with laying down our life, there is something terribly wrong with taking another's. Moreover, while I agree that doing nothing to help a neighbor in need fails to fulfill the command to love our neighbor as ourselves, recall the parable of the Good Samaritan, showing love to one neighbor while killing another misses the point. We should do all we can to aid the neighbor in need, but faithful Christian discipleship does not allow us to help one neighbor while hurting another. The call of Jesus is to love everyone, enemies included. We need to find a better way. Good evening, good morning, wherever you are in this world. Welcome to this uh, special interview with Dr. John Goldingay. And uh, John is a, or was a pastor, I should say. He's from England, then a seminary professor there, then a seminary professor out here in California. Uh, John now lives in retirement in Oxford, England with his wife, Kathleen. He has written a number of books on the Old Testament, and you can read more at johngoldingay.com, uh, which I will post in the chat. So today we'll talk uh, a little bit about 
the book of Psalms and especially the book of Daniel. Uh, John wrote the commentary for the word biblical commentary on the book of Daniel. And this is his website, John and Kathleen show.com. And he has posted many articles there. So good evening, John. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Okay. I was just uh, saying to you uh, before we started, uh, I'm a longtime Bible student. I've read uh, uh, your commentary on Daniel, which I found very interesting, fascinating. And um, I have some questions for you on that. But first, you also did a commentary on the book of Psalms. And mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to start there in, in Psalms. And I want to go to, let's see, Psalm 110, verse 1, is a very important psalm. As you know, this is the most quoted or alluded to um, psalm by the New Testament writers. As I'm talking about verse 1. And as you see there, the NRSV, which I'm using, updated. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, I told you in uh, email conversations that I was asking you about that second Lord there and the Hebrew word behind it. And the reason I asked that was because uh, many scholars through the years that I've read and studied, and here's a quote from uh, the late James Dunn. He said that the Hebrew of Psalm 110 verse 1 uses two different words, Yahweh and Adonai. And there are many others, uh, commentaries, uh, study Bibles that I've seen where they say that the second Lord there is Adonai, not Adoni. Could you comment on that, please? Um, well, the no, the second Lord is Adonai. The first Lord, the first Lord is Adonai. The second Lord is Adonai. Right. Um, so I'll bring up the Hebrew here. Let me see on Bible Hub. So that's the uh, word. That can you tell us a little bit more about that word, Adonai? As far as I know or understand, it is never used for. Yahweh for God in in the Old Testament? I don't think so. No, the um, if you um, that bit that you've highlighted at the left hand end, uh, underneath um, one of the le almost the last letter, there's a dot, uh, and that's the um, that's the thing that indicates that, that word is Adonai. If you go uh, one word to the right, uh, here's a complication. I'm going to have to explain a complication uh, that. Um, the the uh, the consonants you got there in that word to the right are the consonants of the name Yahweh, um, but the vowels are the vowels of the word Adonai, and so if you look underneath that word, um, the last uh, the the left hand uh, of the vowels, there's a thing that looks like a T, and that's the thing that makes the difference between Adonai, that's the thing with the T, and Adonai, that's the thing with the dot. So that that should have confused everybody, shouldn't it, Carlos? Well, <laughs> it's it's funny you bring up the the dot. So we're talking about the um, the vowel points. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll just bring it up here again. Um, so these were added, uh, as far as I've um, been able to research, the vowel points there were added um, about a millennia or so after the New Testament times. Is that right? No, not after. No, no, they, no, no, no. Um, well, no. What happened was that um, until more or less New Testament times. No, no. Start again. If you buy a modern is Israeli newspaper in Hebrew, um, there are no vowels. It's only Hebrew. Hebrew does not have consonants like many other um, Middle Eastern type languages. So you only get the consonants. So you had to um, be able to work out for yourself what the vowels were. The way I uh, explain this to um, to students is is I write up at the blackboard, th, 
CT, ST, N, MT. And that and they the 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 students for whom English is their first language know that that says the cat sat on the mat. The students for whom English is not their first language may not be able to work that out. Which shows that you don't really need vowels if it's your language. Uh, so through Old Testament times, uh, Hebrew was written as modern Israeli Hebrew is, uh, without vowels, just with the consonants. But anybody who, whose language it was didn't have great trouble in working out what the vowels were. The problem ca came today. The problem would be if Hebrew isn't your first language. The problem came in late Old Testament times when many people were now trying to um, read the scriptures for whom Hebrew was not their everyday language. <clears throat> and so eventually in the time um, just before Jesus's day and in the period after Jesus's day, uh, people were devising different ways of signaling what the um, vowels were in order that, that everybody knew what the vowels were. Everybody, I mean, there was a tradition, anybody reading the scriptures out in the synagogue would be able to read it out without the vowels. That they had to supply the vowels as they went along, which they could do. Um, but during that millennium, millennium after Christ, uh, vowels came to be put in for the sake of people like you and me, who uh, for whom Hebrew wasn't their first language. So technically, it's right that the vowels were not put in until a long time after the after the time of Jesus, but they were actually putting the vowels in, um, ma making making them actually be written when previously they'd been, been uh, only spoken. Okay, so they already knew that the uh, the word there, without even the vowel points introduced by, I believe, the Masoretes sometime in the 800s or so, 900 AD, something like that. So Jews reading this, Israelites, ancient Israelites, before the, the pointings, the vowel points, they they still knew how how yeah. to say it and what it said is that is that what you mean yes yeah okay just like so, a modern israeli can read um a, a a bible text that hasn't got vowels in because it's because it's their language so uh, likewise any any uh jew uh in jesus's day would know how to read that that line of, of the psalm that you put up um, but the actual that they they could work out in their own heads, as it were. They knew from what their parents had told them from the when they'd heard it read out and so on. They knew what the vowel points were, but they were they were only put in in that period sometime after Jesus' day. Right. And who is that, uh, my Lord of uh, now? This is a Psalm of David. It's as it's traditionally <laughs> understood. Uh, who was that figure, uh, as far as they know? Uh, well, I, I assume uh, that it's referring that it, not that, that the psalm was not written by David. It could have been written kind of for David. David could be the Adonai. So what the psalm is saying is the Lord, that is God, said to my Lord, that is the king, um, sit at my right hand. Right. And, and the New Testament writers applied that to Jesus? Well, yeah, yeah because in between, uh, obviously... That that word. If you're if you if you if you're living in J, in Jesus in in David's day, if you're a priest living in David's day, and you say, or if you were a prophet like Nathan, uh, and you say, the Lord said to my Lord, then you're talking about da David is the Adonai, David is the Lord. Um, but but if it's then another five hundred years later, and it's in say Ezra's day, uh, and there is no king. Then when you read um, the Lord said to my Lord, you think, who on earth is that about? What's that going to be about? And so the start, the psalm, which didn't start off being about a future Messiah, comes to be about a future Messiah for people because they haven't got a present king. So it comes to be about uh, a future Messiah. So then when Jesus comes along and you know that he's the Messiah, then the psalm comes to be about him. All right. Um... Let, let us move on now to another question I had. And I'm sure you're very familiar with the Shema Israel. I'll mm -hmm. just put it on here. Now, I asked you an email, uh, a question about the word there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, let's see. So we have Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. And I asked you about the word Echad. Um, over here, uh, uh, John, um, there's a lot of talk of the, that Hebrew word meaning more than one. In other words, uh, some apologists say that it means a compound one or a complex unity. Uh, as far as you understand this this uh, this word, uh, does it ever mean more than w one? <laughs> uh, not that, not that I remember. But the point in that particular line is um, that it's an affirmation. The the important thing about that affirmation in Deuteronomy is that you only recognize Yahweh as God. So it's saying um, Yahweh is the one God, and He's the one God for us. And that's the point about the one, I assume. Now, but but again, if you compare that with the um, uh, with the with how things worked with Adonai, then if you're living after New Testament times and you know that God is more complicated than you thought you than you realized before, then um, as you can read back, read Jesus back into the Old Testament, so you can read a more complicated God back into the Old Testament. And that's that I would say is what happens. Okay, so the the Yahweh there of, of the Shema, mm -hmm. um the the Jews would understand Yahweh or Jehovah as, as some say, uh to be uh who we would call the father, um the father of Israel and, and so forth, or not the father of Israel, the father I mean the, the well the father, yeah. Um the father yeah the, yeah yeah they wouldn't well they wouldn't they don't they would they didn't use the father language very much hardly at all um but they would say yahweh is our god right and in in the trinitarian uh understanding of of that verse um so uh is it is it a trinitarian statement of faith or what you would call a unitary monotheistic uh, ancient Israelite statement of faith? Um, it can't be Trinitarian because um, even if you you um, presuppose that the Trinity is true, and I think I just discovered 10 minutes before we started this broadcast that you guys are not Trinitarian, you're Unitarian, right? But even if you are, even if yes. somebody is, even if somebody yes. is Trinitarian, right. um, as I am, uh, sure. Then I, I don't assume that the guys in the Old Testament knew about the Trinity, because they only knew about the Trinity as a result of Jesus coming and the Holy Spirit being given. So, so although on on my assumption, God was Trinity in Deuteronomy, um, when Moses, when God or Moses spoke to the Israelites uh, and talked about being one, or for that matter, when in Genesis God says, "Let us make humankind in our image." They they aren't thinking in terms of Trinity, because hasn't because God hasn't revealed that to them. And over that, you and I can agree. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so let me ask you. Yes, we are a uh, what you might call biblical Unitarian or non-Trinitarian uh, ministry. We obviously do believe Jesus is the Messiah, the the promised uh, King of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so let let me ask you about the um let's see uh, so if we go back to the shema so when jesus as you know jesus uh is asked uh, a very important question in mark 12 i'll just bring it up for for the audience and he's asked uh, by a fellow rabbi uh in mark 12 uh did i put mark 12 yep uh mark 12 uh one of the scribes came and asked jesus which commandment is the greatest um, and then Jesus cites the affirmation Deuteronomy 6 4. Um, do, do you think Jesus, when he uh, appeals to Deuteronomy 6 4 as the statement of faith or the creed of Israel, uh, that he meant it in, in a different way, or, or was he changing that understanding of the Shema? Do you, do you know? Uh, well, I don't see how one can know what was in the back of Jesus' head at the time. Um, but well, let, but but um, when Jesus quotes those two commands, 
I imagine he means the same as any other Jew does. Um, and certainly the guy that he's having the conversation with assumes that because because the guy he's having the conversation with says, you're right, teacher, uh, you, you're true that God is one and besides him there's no other and you love him with all your heart and you love your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus says that about the two commandments, Jesus wasn't saying something original. He wasn't the first Jew to say those two commandments are, are a summary uh, of what the uh, Torah says. So there's nothing in the kind of context that would make them assume that, that make, would make one assume that Jesus means anything any different from any Jew means. Of course, like I say, I don't know what was in the back of Jesus's head, but in terms of what Jesus's words would mean to people, it would be the same as um, anybody else. Right. Yeah. So let let me just highlight what you're saying here. So when Jesus answers the way he does. Uh, then uh, Mark says, the scribe says to Jesus, you are right, teacher, verse yeah. 32. Yeah. You have truly said that he is one. Besides him, there is no other. Yeah. Uh, using the singular personal pronouns there, he and him. Yeah. So I guess um, the scribe is agreeing with Jesus here. Yeah. In a in a very rare instance, as you know, because they, they tend to always be butting heads, unfortunately. But... Uh, it seems like uh, they're understanding their, the creed of Israel, which goes back, you know, to the time of, what is it, Mo uh, Moses, uh, Deuteronomy. So, yeah, they're not, under so you're saying they're not understanding it any other way than than the unitary monotheism, if you want to call it that, of of Israel? Right. Not, not in terms of the, the, like I say, who knows what's in the back of Jesus' head. But in terms of what anybody would assume when they were listening to the conversation, that's true. Um, let me go back to the Shema here. And I I asked you in an email as well if you've heard of uh, splitting the Shema. <laughs> and you said, no, you, you hadn't heard that. No. So what I was referring to, I'll, I'll produce a couple of quotes here. Uh, again, the affirmation Dr. James Dunn, who, who died recently, in his book Christology in the Making, he says that Paul splits the Shema, the Jewish confession of monotheism, between God the Father and Christ the Lord in a way that has no earlier parallel. And then N.T. Wright, Bishop N.T. Wright, a, a fellow, another fellow Brit of yours, in his book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, book one, says that the real shock of the passage in 1 Corinthians 8 is, of course, simply the expansion of the Shema to include Jesus within it. Um, what do you make of that proposition that Paul, in, in his letter there to the Corinthians, uh, either split the Shema or includes Jesus in the, in the Shema? It sounds entirely plausible, but I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm not a, a Paul expert in the way that Tom Wright and uh, Jimmy Dunn are, so I don't really want to. I don't want to. I don't really want to comment on that because I don't know enough about the way that Paul I, Pauline scholars think about these things. But it sounds plausible. Okay, so it's plausible that the um, one Lord of the Shema uh, could include Jesus, uh, as as it's written there. Could could mean? No, I don't. I don't think that's what they mean. I okay. think what they mean, what they mean, is the thing that I said to you just now. That is, when you are when you are in the New Testament or afterwards, and you're looking back on, say, the Shema, then you can you can look at it, you can read it in a new way, the same as when people look back um, from the New Testament at Psalm 110 and they now uh, read it as being about the Messiah when it wasn't about the Messiah uh, originally. So I can see that um, you could read, back, look back at the Shema uh, and see that the Shema covers, as it were, both the Father and the Son. That's not saying that when Moses said that or God said that, that that's what they were talking about. It's saying this is some, this is some new significance you see in it when you are looking back from Jesus. All right. Um, if... So we're live right now. If anyone has any questions uh, for John, just type them in all caps. We'll go for another 20 minutes or so. John, if that's okay. Okay, yep. 
um, let me see. I, I want to move to your work on Daniel, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, I'll just quote some uh, some lines here from your commentary. Again, this is a commentary from the Word Biblical Commentary series, and, and John did the uh, book of Daniel. Uh, you say in part that the theme of the book is that is central to Daniel, as it is to no other book in the Old Testament, is the kingdom of God. Can you tell us uh, a bit more about that? What is the kingdom of God according to Daniel? Uh, well, Daniel's very interested in the fact that God is going to rule the entire world. Uh, I mean, the, the whole Old Testament is interested in the fact that God is going to be king over the whole world. But it's a more lively issue in the book of Daniel, partly because of the historical situation, I guess, uh, in that the book of Daniel um, it, it, it talks about, is living in the context of, it's relating to a time when the Babylonians are the kings of the world, and then the Persians are king, the kings of the world, and then the, the Greeks are the kings of the world. So the question is, who's really the kings of the world? Who, who, what, what is the kingdom, the ruling kingdom? Uh, and Daniel is saying, well, two things, really. One is, even though it doesn't look like it, God is actually the king of the world now. But also, the time is going to come when God is going to put all these kingdoms down, and then God is going to be the king of the world. And it's, it's that sort of theme. That, uh, that makes the theme of God's kingship, God's kingdom, more cent central to Daniel in a way which it isn't to anywhere else in the Old Testament, I'd say. And when is this kingdom coming? Do, do you get uh, any glimpses of that in, in Daniel? Did he have, uh, the writer of Daniel, did he have an understanding of, uh, um, obviously, Right now, if you know, if you look, look out your window or, or watch the news, <laughs> it's all chaos. Right. Um, the, but the, as far as I understand the kingdom, uh, John, it's uh, Psalm 2, right? The, the, uh, there will be no war, peace. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the New Testament talks about no tears, uh, the resurrection. Uh, do you see all that in Daniel as well, to, just to unfold that a little bit more? Well, you, you just said that if you look out the window, window, you can see that the kingdom of God has arrived. But you probably know that the Gospels say that the kingdom of God has arrived. Um, so we have a tension between the fact that the kingdom of God is still is something that we know is not here, but we know is going to be here sometime. But we also know that, for instance, when Jesus came, in a sense, the kingdom of God arrived. And all through the scriptures, you've got a tension of that kind between knowing that the kingdom of God hasn't yet fully arrived and yet knowing that from time to time God asserts his kingship uh, and God's reign happens to some extent, but not in a final way. And you get that happening all through the Old Testament. Uh, and Daniel is one of the points at which it happens. So that, for instance, um, when the in the Babylon when when Daniel is taken off to Babylon, then the Babylonians are in charge. The king of the, the, the Babylonian king is the king of kings. But a few decades later, within Dan, within Daniel's lifetime. Um, the Babylonians are put down and the Persians come to rule. Uh, and the Old Testament sees that as, if you like, God asserting his kingship. You get the same thing happening later on. In the visions in Daniel talk about a great act of deliverance whereby, whereby God is going to assert his kingship. In the second century, when um, the uh, Hellenistic Greek uh, authorities ruled by King Antiochus, um, stop the Jewish people in Jerusalem from obeying the Torah and martyr people who try to do it. And the visions in Daniel, particularly in Daniel 10 to 12, promise that God is going to assert his authority. And he does. Um, and so you see the kingdom of God arrive to some extent when the Persians put down the Babylonians. You see the kingdom of God arrive um, when uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is put down. You see the kingdom of God arrive when Jesus uh, comes. So you've always got a, 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 a tension between God acting as king now and asserting king's kingship, but, it, but you're also knowing that the time when his final kingship, when his kingship is finally established, is still in the future. So we still look forward to it. Right. Um, so let, let me show you, uh, let's see. So, so 
uh, the first words, as far as I know, out of the mouth of Jesus is about this kingdom, right? Yeah. And right. this is in Mark 1. Uh, right. Now, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news or the gospel of God. And Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom has come near. Repent, believe in the good news or the gospel. Um, so in the language of Jesus, this reminds me a lot, uh, John, of the the prophets of the Old Testament, right? Right, uh, right. It's in particular, the minor prophets, I believe, they talk about, you know, the day of the Lord is near or the day right. of the Lord is at right. hand. Right. So you're so you're saying obviously the the uh, total fulfillment of those Old Testament prophets and Jesus is yet to be in in right. in some future time. Right now, if that's the case, uh, what um, uh, going back to Daniel, what do you see there as heralding that ultimate fulfillment of of the kingdom of Earth? Like some of the events that Daniel might talk about that must transpire. For that to happen, um, no, I don't think he really gives you any clue about that. Okay, so for example, I was thinking of a passage like uh, Daniel chapter nine, right, where, where it talks about, as you know, the abomination of desolation, the seventy weeks. Right. Uh, do, so you don't see that as a sort of a uh, schedule, as it were, or a uh, time clock. Well, it, it, it was that. That's the, what that's referring to. Is the thing I was talking about just now when Antiochus Epiphanes uh, bans um, worship of um, the proper the proper observance of the Torah and proper sacrifices in the temple and so on. Um, and that passage in Daniel nine is talking about God bringing an end to that process, which is what happened in one six four BC uh, when um, God. Uh, and the Jewish people um, saw Antiochus off, and Antiochus um, got killed, and so the from so it was possible to restore the worship of the temple and the service of Yahweh in the temple. So that oh, yeah, so that's the that's that that that's an event like the fall of Jerusalem or like the fall of the um, kingdom of Babylon. Uh, that is a a, a sort of realization. Uh, of the um, coming of the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, okay, so let, let's move to Daniel 12. Um, and we see there the uh, famous resurrection of verses. Yeah. Uh, it says, at that time, Michael, the great prince, protector of your people, shall, shall rise or arise. And then it talks about those who sleep in the dust of the earth. Do you connect that also to the past, to the Maccabean period, or or do you see this as a future event? Or, well, I think it's more that when whenever God talks about the future, uh, about the final uh, consummation and fulfillment of His kingdom, um, it's a big, glorious picture. Uh, and one of the bits of the picture, then, therefore, is, uh, uh, for instance, of people who have lost their lives being given their lives back. Um, but it's characteristic that that, um, that when when God offers the prophets a picture of the future, it's the big glorious final picture. Um, the thing then that then happens is something, but it's not everything. Uh, and in that deliverance in 164 uh, BC, uh, resurrection didn't happen, but deliverance um, and the possibility of the people being able to worship God again. That did happen. So you get a little a little embodiment of the picture, but not a complete embodiment of the picture, and you don't get resurrection in that context. Right. Um, I have a question here. Sorry, I can't put it on the screen. But the question basically is that um, I believe around three times uh, this, um, this chapter, Daniel 12, uses that phrase at that time. Mm-hmm. To what period of time is that referring to in, in your it's understanding? It's referring to the time when God uh, delivers people in the 160s from the oppression of Antiochus and him stopping uh, them being able to serve God properly. Okay, and what about the phrase um, in verse 13? Um, uh, let's see, the, the angel, I believe, speaking for God, 
says to Daniel, uh, go to your own way and rest. In other words, you're going to die. And then you will rise for your reward at the end of days. As you know, some translations have there at the end of the age. Um, that, that phrase appears a lot in the sayings of Jesus in some of his parables, as you know. Um, what, so what does the Bible mean by the end of the age? Or in this case, sorry, Daniel, yeah. I think it uses it in two ways that fit with what we've been talking about so far. That is, sometimes it means the end of a period. I take again um, when the people are going to be delivered from Antiochus in the 160s. Then the end of the age uh, means the end of this period of oppression and persecution and martyrdom uh, that's, that is going to come about um, when the people are delivered then. Sometimes it means the end of the days in the sense in which we probably usually use that phrase. That is, the, the, the end with a big E. Um, and you again because because there's this because the th these two kinds of happening are happening within history and are happening that comes of the end of history because they are related to each other in the way that they are so um, the end of the days or the end of the age can apply to either of those and you com you pro you commonly it's only afterwards that you know whether when God acts in your context, that is actually the end of the end, the end of the days with a big E, or whether it's simply a, a little bit of an end of the days in your context. When beforehand, the way the prophets talk, you could think it's going to be the final end, but only afterwards do you realize, oh, it wasn't the final end, it was a, an end with a small E. Okay, uh, we have a few live questions. Let's see, let me try and get this up. Um, did Jesus have a God? I don't know what that means. Um, you know, in the Shema, he says, listen, Israel, uh, the Lord, our God is one Lord. Uh, well, I think did, that's did, what did, they're did worship, Well, yes. Did, did Jesus worship God? Yes. Right. Well, Jesus, you know, in the Shema, it says our God. So Jesus says... Our God, he says, my God, various times in the New Testament. Right. I think that's yeah. where the question's coming from. Yep. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, about the kingdom, where will this kingdom be? Uh, is it like a location, a physical place? <laughs> Why? Well, uh, I guess. No, no, I think it's that's a that's a good illustration of how the word king, the English word kingdom, isn't very helpful, and and reign. Uh, in the sense of of uh, the reign of a king or kingship is a less misleading kind of uh, expression than kingdom in britain because the kingdom this this kingship this this realm of god's reigning is not a particular place no it's um it's the whole world or the whole universe or the whole reality uh, is going to be where god reigns Right. Um, well, I, I guess uh, maybe the question is coming from the place of, uh, you know, Zion, Jerusalem features prominently in the prophets as the sort of capital of the kingdom. Uh, do, right. do you see Jerusalem uh, as the capital of that worldwide kingdom or did the prophets? Um, I don't think they particularly talk in that way. <clears throat> the prophets? Uh, right. About Jerusalem? Okay. Uh, let's see, just one more here. Um, thank you, Dr. Goldengate. From your Old Testament studies, what can you share about the temple and sacrifice in millennial rule when Jesus comes? Um, I don't see why the... Um, uh, I don't think there's any, that there's any indication... Um, that the temple or the sacrifices will be restarted at the end. But I think the presuppositions here about the millennium and so on are ones that I probably don't share. It depends whether you're pre-millennial and post-millennial and amillennial and those things, and uh, I'm not very up on those, really. Okay, so you, you wouldn't describe yourself as, as a pre-meal, post-meal, amill? No. Um, no, not really. I think it's um, uh, 
I think it's trying to build too much on the, the millennium is something that only gets mentioned a couple of times in the book of, of Revelation. It doesn't get mentioned anywhere else in scripture. Uh, and it's it's an image. And I'm not sure how, uh, that one can, that it's helpful to try to move to a, a literal period of a thousand years to try to make it a, a focal point for understanding what God is going to do. Um, in your WBC um, commentary, you, you have a line there that sort of stood out to me. You say that the restoration to life in Daniel 12, as, as we're seeing, is a restoration to earthly life of whole people, not of disembodied spirits, spirits in heaven. Right. Uh, can you tell us a, a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, shall I link it with the New Testament? The New Testament does not say we're going to go to uh, as to, to heaven as souls. It says that we're going to be given resurrection bodies. We're going to raise as, be raised as whole people. Um, and so the the way that the New, the New Testament talks about our resurrection is similar in that sense to the way that Daniel talks. Um, it's it's a it's re it's a resurrection of people as a whole, body and spirit. Um, uh, in in what, if you like, in what the book of Revelation talks about is the new Jerusalem. Uh, right. And let's see. I had. Which might fit with your question about Zion. I haven't thought about this, but yeah. uh, but but as the as the book of Revelation talks about a new Jerusalem, then, yeah, the, the Jerusalem, Zion um, is going to be the center um, of the, the new world, of the resurrection world. Yeah, yeah, the you're right. The uh, Jerusalem features prominently. You're talking about the Revelation of John or the Apocalypse. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So, but by the way, just as a side note, um, I'm not. Sure, you say you're an Old Testament scholar, not New Testament, but uh, I'm sure you. It doesn't stop me then saying things about the New Testament when I feel like it. Okay. <laughs> um, do, do you see? Uh, the the writer of Revelation, John, attributed to him. Do you see him uh, borrowing a lot or or being influenced a lot by the Book of Daniel? Uh, more by Ezekiel, I think. Okay, but certainly by I mean by the prophets. Um, uh, a a New Testament scholar who um, whose lectures I used to go to, not more than a mile from than than uh, more than where I'm sitting now, called George Caird. Uh, who wrote a, a commentary on the book of Revelation, uh, once said that something like that there isn't a single quotation from the prophets um, in Revelation, but you wouldn't, you, you, there's hardly a verse in Revelation that would exist if you took out the language from the prophets, the allusions to the prophets. Got it. Yeah, that that's interesting. Uh, the Ezekiel one with, yeah. with Daniel. It's, I think it's, more is, is, is Daniel. Yeah, but, um, but more, right. most of all, I think probably Ezekiel, uh, and right. then Daniel, Jerem, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Right. Um, let's see. We we have uh, a few minutes here. Uh, actually, let me bring up this. Uh, let's see this question. Will people be given a second chance to be saved in the second resurrection? Um, I, um, I don't think the New Testament says that, but that's one of those points at which I'll say I don't, uh, it's a New Testament type question. Um, why is monotheism important and why is it Yahweh? That is a great, I love that question. <laughs> because you see, in the Old Testament, monotheism isn't, isn't really important. The important thing in the Old Testament, as the Shema implies, is not that there is only one God. It's that Yahweh is the only God. The Old Testament isn't very worried about how many gods there are. The question of how many gods there are, the question of monotheism, came to be an important question after Jesus' day. Paul at one point says, there are gods many and lords many. He's not interested in the monotheism question. The really important question is not whether there's only one God, it's who is the one God. Uh, and the Old Testament thinks the really important affirmation then is that Yahweh is the only God. Yahweh is the one God. Okay. Um, let's uh, finish um, as we wrap up here. 
with let's go back to Daniel 7 and as you know this is a very um important vision here in Daniel 7 and he talks about beasts coming out of the sea and so forth and so on um and then this figure one like a human being or a son of man as you know uh, this is Jesus favorite self designation son of man i believe 80 plus times uh, throughout the gospels um can you tell us more about this, um, uh, what what looks like a glorified human person? Um, because, may, uh, again, apologists on, on this side of, of the world anyway, equate that figure with the ancient one, with Yahweh or God. Uh, how do you understand this figure in, in Daniel 7, Son of Man? In, in the vision in Daniel 7, yeah, the, the ancient the ancient one is God uh, the Son of man is a human being um, by 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 the time of Jesus um, the the person who is simply a, a, a human being in Daniel 7 that that has come to be a title for a supernatural figure and so when Jesus is talking about the Son of man uh, he is talking about the Son of man as people talk about the Son of man, in his context he's not talking directly about daniel he's talking about the son of man as a figure uh, in ter in in the terms that people use in his day so again it's an example of how there's a difference between what the prophet meant what the prophet was signifying how the prophet how god was communicating with people in the prophet's day and what people in new testament times what jesus and other people in new testament times were able to learn from um, the Old Testament when they uh, looked at it in light of their own context. So in Daniel, the Son of Man is a human figure. In, New Test in a New Testament context, the Son of Man has become a supernatural figure. Uh, by that, do you mean he uh, he becomes associated with Jesus? A well, G uh, what do you mean? No, no, because... When you say supernatural figure, what do you... Just well, in, th there is um, there are other um, Jewish writings from between from from Daniel's day and up to New Testament times that talk about a, a son of man, specifically the uh, writings that are called the books of Enoch, uh, which uh, is the Enoch who's in Genesis, but they weren't written back then. They were written in Daniel in the time of um, in the third century, second century, first century. And the writings of Enoch talk about talk about the Son of Man, but but they talk about the Son of Man as a supernatural, a heavenly figure, uh, not not God, but a heavenly supernatural figure. Uh, and so, what Jesus is doing is picking up the way in which um, Jewish writings like Enoch use the phrase Son of Man, and using that as a way of um, being able to help people and to understand Him. It's 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 quite a, a distance away. From the way that Daniel 7 is talking about Son of Man. Uh, we have a question about this. The LXX, which is the Greek translation of or the Septuagint mm -hmm. of uh, the Hebrew Bible, renders the Aramaic Pelach as Latrevo, uh, used in the New Testament. Uh, sorry, there's a typo there. Used in the New Testament for God alone. Uh, doesn't this mean that Son of Man is God? Uh, that's too complicated for me. Sorry, I can't put, get my mind around that. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, and, and we should note that. Uh, um, is it most of Daniel written in Aramaic? Which which parts are? Uh, okay. Chapter 1 and a bit of chapter 2 is Hebrew. Then most of chapter 2 through chapter 7 is Aramaic. And then chapters Got 8 it. to 12 is Hebrew. Got it. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, John, for... Okay. Uh, jo joining us, uh, we'll leave okay. it there. So, that is your website. Uh, you you post articles there. Uh, how often do you? Do when you I've got something there? to say. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> so, all right, we'll leave it there. If you can just hold a, a few minutes. Uh, okay. In the back room here. So, thank you so much to uh, Dr. John uh, Goldingay there. Um, I would recommend you read his uh, commentary on Daniel. Very interesting about if you're interested about the kingdom of God, the son of man, as he was saying. So, and uh, we'll leave it there. So until next time, God bless until we meet again.